And without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our very first speaker, who's Dr. Anne-Marie Hanlon, who's from the Cranfield School of Management, and she'll be taking us through the session on social media. And then we'll be followed by um, how to engage with the wider media, followed by blogs. So Anne-Marie, over to you. Excellent. Thank you so much for inviting me, Audrey, and thank you all so much for turning up. I know this is a week where instead of talking about how many sleeps are there before Christmas, it's how many Zoom meetings do you have before Christmas? And I spoke to somebody yesterday and I was saying, I think I've got 13 Zooms. And she said, only 13. I think she had at least 18 and that was only till Thursday. So let's have a look at what I'm going to take you through in this session. I'm going to give you an overview of social media. So how does this fit in to your profile as an academic or as a researcher? And why does it matter? Why is it important? Then I'm going to give you some guidance on LinkedIn best practice. And then finally, we're going to look at Twitter. We see LinkedIn and Twitter as those professional social media networks. And that's why I focus on those not on Facebook, not on TikTok or Instagram, although there are questions with these too. So these are the main social networks that I'm looking at between now and uh, for the next 40 minutes. And I've asked you to pop, if you do have a Twitter um, address into the chat, if you would like to, and um, then we can perhaps follow each other later. If you've got questions as you're going along, if you put them onto chat, you'll see that I'm looking at you on one screen here, but I also have a very large screen over here. So I'm, I'm looking in this direction. It's because I'm using dual screens and it's this one here that I've got the, uh, the chat in. So every now and then I'll just cast a glance to see if there's anything on there that I should be looking at. So let's start and look at social media in context. As an academic or as a researcher, you probably already have a whole range of networks and platforms that you use. And there's a good chance that at the center of this will be ORCID. Ideally, ORCID will be your primary academic platform, especially as um, UKRI has said, that ORCID is now going to be the key platform that they use in their funding system. So because that's, they've actually placed that out there and they've said this is key to our funding and this is where we will look at academics, that will be in the centre of your own personal social media professional ecosystem. And within that, you will link your LinkedIn to ORCID and I'll show you how you can do this. You will also link your Twitter to ORCID and again, I'll give you some guidance on that and the other platforms that you use. So if you're using Google Scholar, if you're using ResearchGate or Academia, within LinkedIn, there are ways to actually include all of these websites and I'll explain how that works too. You may also have your own webpage or you may have a university webpage. If you're, and I can see we've got some postdocs in, um, in the group too. So if you're a, a postdoc, you may have a university page or you may be looking at other research, but part of connecting all these elements is to funnel and drive traffic to your research so that you can increase its impact, which is a critical factor. There is a little bit of etiquette in uh, social media, which we, I refer to as the four Ps. I come from a marketing background and everything is alliterative in marketing. So the first of these P's is professional and LinkedIn and Twitter in particular are professional social media platforms. There are fewer negative comments or flame comments, unless of course you're working in an area such as politics, which tends to be heated most of the time. It also tends to be a polite space. People ask for things and they share information and they help others. And there's also, I feel, an issue that you should consider, which is about prioritizing who you connect with. So for example, on Twitter, I don't follow, because it's not my area, 
movie stars or pop stars. They're of no real interest to me, not within my professional space. So I'm likely to follow other academics, marketing scholars, organizations that may be of interest. And I'll give you more idea about this later too. You can also be proud and share your achievements. And we've started to see, I've noticed in the last six months, more people who've gained their doctorate during a pandemic have actually shared this online. And they have had a great, I think, outpouring of kindness from many quarters where people have been saying, well done, this is an incredible achievement. So at the moment, if you have an achievement that you wish to share, if you've had a paper published or something like this, these are great avenues to consider to share that. And I'll talk about that more again later. You should have one consistent identity. And this is where ORCID can be very helpful because if you've had one name and then you have a second name, whether that's a maiden name or a change of name, it can all tie into this one space. I would also recommend one consistent identity in terms of your photo. My photo is woefully out of date because it was taken pre-lockdown and my hair has grown a lot in this time. So try to make sure that you've got that one consistent identity and the one consistent photo across your platforms. Also think about what are your domain keywords? When you're submitting an article, what are the three, four or five keywords that you use most often? And keep those and copy those and put them into a Word document that will become your social media profile document. And then you can also think about using those keywords as hashtags when you're later promoting your work. So that gives you an overview as to why that's all needed and how it all connects. Let's dive in a little deeper and look at LinkedIn. I think for me, LinkedIn is mainly used by people on a desktop or on a laptop. It's less often visited on a mobile phone. And this means there are many areas that you can actually develop. So I'll start in this top right hand corner. You can personalize the cover and this can be the same as Twitter. And the easiest way to do this, if you're not um, graphically talented, and I'm not, I use PowerPoint. So I create something in PowerPoint and then I copy and paste it or I search online um, and use something such as um, Canva. Canva can be quite useful for actually creating things in specific sizes. But whatever you've created, try and make sure that it's exactly the same in both your LinkedIn and your Twitter, which is where you have space for this banner. I mentioned about the photo and having the consistent image. And then again, if you use a headline, this is where this appears. And I'll show you that in a moment, because a headline is useful. In LinkedIn, which is the largest professional search database that exists, LinkedIn gives you the opportunity to create your own headline. So effectively tell your own story in, um, in not very many characters. And if you don't use the headline, it will by default pull out your job description, your job title. So it will pull out your current job title as your headline, unless you decide you're not just that job title, you do more than that. You can add profile sections. And in this area, you can add your work, your education, your skills, any awards you may have gained. And this is also a space to add your publications. You don't have to add all your publications. And for some people, that would be an endless task that would take far too long. So if you're very successful and you have very many publications, I would recommend that you add the your preferred or selected publications in the same way that on your um, research or academic CV, you would just showcase the publications that you were most proud of. If you're a newer academic, a postdoc, and you don't have so many publications, it's a great time to be able to add these and to actually try and get some 
interaction, engagement, downloads, comments, feedbacks, because this all feeds into the impact of a piece of work that you have done. To make any of these changes, you simply go into LinkedIn and you click on the little pencil and that's where you can make all those changes. You can literally edit all those things very, very quickly in that space. So if I just hop out of um, my presentation and if I go into LinkedIn and I click on the picture of me and that's where I can view profile and in the view profile, I literally click on the pencil. So it's literally that simple to start editing. The one thing I would do absolutely with that um, every time is I would make sure that you write the content in a Word document or similar that has a good spell checker. The LinkedIn spell checker is not that good. And this will also give you a greater character count and will show you as your career develops or as you move into other areas, what you have used in the past and what's worked well. So that starts with that overall heading and many people don't use the headline and they don't consider using the banner image. If you don't use the banner image, LinkedIn will by default add a banner image for you, which tends to be a gray block with a blue circle or something in it. So it's worth using. And that could be a piece of work you wanted to showcase. It could be in a pre-pandemic situation where you were standing on a stage and you were speaking to an audience or teaching a class, or if you work in a lab, maybe it's um, a great photo showing lab work or something along these lines. So in that area I've just showed you, when you click on the pencil, this is where you can edit the content. I'm a more recent academic. I've been a practitioner for most of my career. And I've decided that I've worked for the title doctor and I'm going to use it. So LinkedIn doesn't automatically give me a space to use this. So I've put it into my first name. And this does a couple of things for me. The first thing is, it tells me if somebody is spamming me with a connection invitation, because it says, hey, doctor, we have lots in common, let's connect. So I know that's been done automatically by a machine rather than a person. And I can just delete those invitations straight away. That's one thing it does. But the second thing it does, as soon as I added my title, I think I had 50 new invitations to connect overnight. Um, it seems I wasn't good enough to, um, to connect to beforehand, but I added the title and I was. And some of those were actually beneficial for other things, other projects I'm working on. And that can be a great way to look to work with companies if you're looking for company projects in some shape or form. The next line is where you change your headline. And you could change your headline once a year, or maybe if you have a new role or you have um, gained an award or achieved something. This is the key difference between social media and traditional media. It's not static, it is dynamic, and you can change it to reflect a significant change. The current position, as I say, is automatic. Education, you can add or you could ignore. I've plenty on my profile, so I haven't ticked this. Hmm. Now, this is an interesting thing. Because LinkedIn is an American organization, and I imagine because you're through UCL, many of you are in the, um, maybe in London or maybe in the UK or part of that wider UCL family. One of the key things here is that um, LinkedIn works on American zip codes, American postcodes. So it doesn't really understand our UK system. So although I teach at Cranfield and pre-pandemic, I was in London on a frequent basis, I live north of Birmingham in a small city, but it doesn't have its own postcode. So it attaches me to somewhere else that people don't recognize. So I've actually just taken a city of London postcode and put that in and just said that I'm in London. 
it's easier for overseas projects. They understand where that is. And that's what you can do. You can change it, but you can only have one location in LinkedIn, unlike Twitter. There are very limited industry options. You could be in higher education or education management. Research, it doesn't totally understand. Market research, it understands, but other than that, it doesn't. So you may need to look through that to see what you want to select. And then this is where you connect all your different platforms and you add these web links into the edit profile. At the bottom of that list, there is a space that says contact info. And here it has another little pencil. So what you do here is rather than putting company website, my blog or something like this, for every possible item you're adding here, add the words other or click on, on the drop down box and select other. Type in what it is, but there are only 30 characters for this and then put the URL in. So I have a digital marketing textbook and I've got the link to the book resources with which lots of marketing teachers need. Um, Orchid, I've clicked on other, then I've typed Orchid. I haven't put other details than that. And I've just put the web URL. And again, this is where you could add your Twitter, your university homepage, or another project that you may have worked on. You can add several into here. And literally all you do is click the pencil, select the other, and just type in a description of what that is. So how do you create that compelling profile? How are you found? You do actually have to update your work, your project or research experience, and add a little bit more than your job title. So you might add a little more depth and detail and richness to it. So somebody is looking at that and they're thinking, oh, that's really interesting. It was connected to that. And this can be a good place where you make sure that your domain keywords are included. And you can add more details. You can upload media. So if you had presented at a conference and there was a PowerPoint that was about a particular piece of research that you were doing, you could actually upload that PowerPoint into LinkedIn to show what you've been doing there. If you've written a report about some research for an impact case study, which is important for REF, again, you can upload that to LinkedIn. You can ask people to share it. And then you actually have the possibility of a direct impact measure there because you can count the number of people who have um, commented on, on it or liked it. And if you have connected it to a website where you can count the downloads, that can be helpful too. And as I mentioned, add your selected publications. I'm just going to pause to see if there's any particular questions in the chat at the moment. Okay, so no particular questions that have jumped up right now about LinkedIn. I'm sure that will occur in a moment. So having looked at that top level overview of LinkedIn and what to include, we then move into Twitter. And I think for me, Twitter, I find really interesting for some specific reasons. Since um, 2015, every single tweet has been indexed by Google. So this means if somebody is typing for that piece of re research that you did, that project you're working on, if you have tweeted about it more than once, there is a really good chance that Google will find it. And because Google has indexed all tweets since 2015, and because Google um, or, or Twitter through its fire hose, through its data stream, can give researchers access back to older data, it's worth seriously considering because it does form part of search engine results. But there are more reasons why Twitter is so important. Every journalist, every editor, every policymaker, every decision maker, every company, every university, they're all on Twitter. 
So if you are speaking about, again, a particular area, your own domain, your own area, you can then uh, add a tweet and you can make a comment about this. This may be of interest to um, JG Gill uh, or a JG at uh, Times Higher, or it could be of interest to um, Michael Savage at uh, The Observer and Guardian. So it gives you possibilities to directly promote work to journalists. And if you get work published on a portal such as The Conversation, The Conversation uses Twitter a lot. And if you share and comment that you've had something and you tag in The Conversation, they will share it with its much wider audience too. So. LinkedIn does that first thing where it positions you within your audience, but also makes sure that you can be found and also within your network and people that you might meet at conferences and events would be willing to share your work more widely. Twitter can actually pr help to promote that work. So both of these spaces are areas that you could use to measure and to consider the impact of what you've achieved. So what are the essentials in the Twitter profile? Same photo, same background, the bio. Bio is much shorter. So this is literally 160 characters. And again, I write this in Word and then I copy and paste, but you can include keywords, hashtags, and links to others. Again, it's one of these areas that's not static, it's dynamic, so you can change this on a regular basis. So you could change it once a quarter or once a year, or if you've just had something successfully published, you can actually change your entire bio that says, read my latest article on subject, and then put the link here to that specific item. To get, the, uh, to get it seen more widely. Twitter tends to be used by a different audience. LinkedIn is a very professional audience. Twitter is also a professional audience, but Twitter is used much more by journalists, by writers, content creators, professionals. And the one thing that um, presidents and prime ministers have done is they have explained the use of Twitter to a much wider audience. So where at one point Twitter looked like it was going a little static, and it may be there was a point where you had a Twitter account some years ago and you just haven't used it for a while, this is where you could think about getting back to it. Your location. So I've changed my location at the moment, and I've changed it to say at Cranfield on Zoom and Teams, because pretty much that's where I am. So Twitter allows you to totally personalize that. So you could change it to say, I'm working in the lab, I'm in the library, um, I'm um, at UCL in, in this location or in this location. You can change it specifically to where it, you, you want it to be. And again, it's not static. So what else in here? We have two critical things on here. We have your username, which is your at name, and this is the, the 15 characters. You can't change, you shouldn't change this after you've got it. It's um, more complicated to change it. Somebody else might take it. But your actual name is the part that Google sees, and that you can change. So for example, if you can't get your own name, and because I've used Twitter for a number of years, I was able to get my own name, if you can't get it, I would strongly recommend that you don't go ahead and you don't use um, the numbers and letters thing. So I wouldn't have Anne-Marie Hanlon 1976 because that can tell people um, you know, a birth year or an important date or whatever it is. You can put that in there and that's not a good idea. You're better off to either um, put your, if you can, put doctor in there, great, or PhD afterwards, or you may need to dig deep and use a middle initial or something about your domain. Sometimes people use um, their name and they use the word tweets. So it might be um, 
um, John tweets or Sarah tweets or Chloe tweets, um, or sometimes they will put official if they can, if they've got enough space to. Other elements that are on there too is the website. So in the same way that I'm directing people at the moment who are saying, how do I get hold of um, ready-made PowerPoint slides for my class? I thought the easiest thing to do was to put the link on Twitter during the pandemic. So that's what I've done. Equally, if you've published something, you can literally go ahead and you can add the link straight away into the, the DOI for the journal article or whatever you've published, add it straight in there. And somebody has mentioned they've started to use their... Um, Okay, I've got a couple of questions. I'm going to pause on that. Um, somebody wants to know about the, um, an excellent question. When you add your ORCID to your um, LinkedIn, where does it appear on your profile? Okay, well, let me just go into uh, here. So I click on the picture of me. I click on view profile. And as soon as I'm loaded and I'm in the view profile, I will then um, click on the pencil and I will start editing. I will scroll down here, click on the pencil right at the very bottom. Here's where I've added ORCID and I'll just put academic website on here. I'll click on apply. Okay, so I've done that. I'll click on save. And then as I'm in here, if I then click on and if I go into an incognito window um, and I go to LinkedIn, yeah, I agree. Where, oh, that's never going to work, is it going to an incognito window? On here, it will, um, I will see it and you would see it specifically if I look at this person here. So I'll look at Chris here. And as soon as I click on his contact info, I can see here's his first website, which is his um, the architect website. Here is a blog and here is a, a team's training hub. So that's where you would see it. That's where the outside world would see it. That was an excellent um, question that somebody's added. Um, Okay, and there's another question that I will be answering in a moment. If you have a university page, what is the advantage of LinkedIn? Oh, I would say for, um, for the future. So, for example, if I look at UCL and I go on to the school, and then maybe I want to see lots of employees that are there, I can see people who are two degrees of separation away from me, so I'm not directly connected. I'm indirectly connected to them. The main reasons for LinkedIn would be, if you were ever going to look for a new job in the, in the future, it would be the first place people would look for you. Um, I would also suggest it's a good way to widen your network. If you meet people at a conference, you cannot add them to your... Um, you can add them to your email address book, but as soon as you move universities, your address book generally stays with the university and the email system you're using. So it allows you to do that. It also means that if there's somebody you met at a conference four or five years ago that you haven't spoken to for a while, you can reconnect with them on LinkedIn. So there are a few advantages in different ways there. So let me return in and look at Twitter. And I'm going to answer a question here about if you find journalists, how do you connect with them? So these are the key things to sort out your Twitter profile in the beginning. And as I said before, also showcase your work. And I've simply copied and pasted from um, the Twitter. It's the same banner in each place. So what can you do? Twitter, and I would argue, um, how do they fit into your professional profile? You can promote and amplify your research projects. If you're supervising students, you can say, um, we need a certain group of people to take part in the survey, please will you help? And this was one that was on Twitter. And they, they said here, please retweet. So they ask people to share this. 
This could have also been added to uh, LinkedIn. So it's a great way of snowball, snowball sampling for a specific area. So it has an additional benefit in that way. How else can you use it? You can use it as UCL did recently. Look at this brand new funding call alert. Pathways to Achievements funding call will award papers for up to this. Click here to learn more. This is a fantastic example of how you use Twitter. So this could be something that you shared. Now, postdocs, or when you when you when you are um, when you've gained your PhD and maybe you're looking for a postdoc, this can be a useful way to find these postdoc opportunities. If you are beyond that and you've been using LinkedIn and, and Twitter for some time and you're um, an academic of some standing and you've been working for some time in, in academia, you can also use it to potentially help and support your students and let them know what is happening and what they can apply for. And if you're recruiting a postdoc, it's a great way to widen that talent pool as well. What else can you do? So let's imagine you uh, had a paper published a year ago, or even two years ago, or even three years ago. You spend so long trying to get a paper published. It's one of the most challenging aspects, I think, to academia. You spend so long trying to get it published, and then you are measured on, well, what's your H index, how many people downloaded it, saw it. So many academics are incredibly modest and they have this amazing paper and they don't really share it that widely. And as soon as I'm in that amazing position where I managed to get a paper published, I will be sharing it absolutely everywhere for some considerable time. So what you can do is if you've got a paper that's maybe a few years older, you can actually share this to a wider audience on LinkedIn and on Twitter. And you can use the magic words, in case you missed it. In case you missed it, here is my recently published, recent within a year. Here is my popular paper, whatever it is. You find words to put that in and you add some words and maybe some hashtags and then a direct link to it. And what this will do is this will directly increase your, um, your, your H index, your, um, your profile. And that's, that's a key thing. So that's one thing you can do. The other thing you can do, and again, um, somebody else has mentioned, I've got some great questions here. If you would like to find journalists to find or take notice, do you recommend direct messaging or tagging them? Absolutely, yes, I do. At the moment, journalists are desperate for stories, especially something new, especially something different, and especially some good news. So if you have anything that fits into that, this is a great way to do this. You could tag them and say, I've written this, which has discovered, and this is nearly like the one minute thesis project where you say in, um, in uh, less than 280 characters, what your, uh, what your research is about, what the project was about. But also when you have done that and say they've published it, you then mention here. So for example, um, Claire is an academic and she's written some interesting stuff on feeding children. And she then reposted about the fact that she was going to be in um, on the radio talking about this. So she shared this as a, a media opportunity. UCL media team, will have opportunities for you to talk about your work if they know what you're doing. So it's great if you can share with them what you are doing. Okay, let's have a look. Um, <coughs> excuse me, there's another question here, it's a great question. If you're developing your LinkedIn or Twitter profiles for the first time, is it okay to include historic achievements, conference presentations, anything? Yes, it is. These will, if any of these have a contribution and they can help somebody who is new to research in that area or who is conducting research in that area or um, looking at a literature review, absolutely, yes, it is. All of those things help enormously. So do 
um, do go ahead and share that. So how do you build your audience? LinkedIn, I'm less concerned about building an audience. I connect with people that I've either met or maybe if you'd sent me an, an invitation but you said you were on this call, then I would connect with you. But I won't connect with people if I don't know who they are and I don't know where they've come from because they could be, um, they could be fake profiles. They do exist. Uh, on Twitter, uh, I will follow people in my, in my area and they will engage back and then I will follow them. But I will follow key publications other academics, whether or not they follow me. I will tag relevant authors um, every, yeah, every time I have something to speak to them about. But I will also ask them to please share, please share, please retweet. And this is where this Twitter language that was a very, very long sentence, please will you retweet my post, became please retweet and then became please retweet or RT, as you can see here in the end, because it uses fewer characters. Do that and your audience will gradually grow. There are some pitfalls to avoid. Um, it's technically complex to delete a tweet once it's been issued. It's just like toothpaste. When it's out of the tube, you can't put it back in. So do think about it. There, are, uh, there is spam, there are trolls online, it is what it is. And I would just suggest that you block them, you report them and don't follow them. And I would make sure you have a clear purpose for using Twitter. My purpose tends to be talking about digital and social media marketing. I share a lot of, um, if I find a paper, so I'm writing the second edition or I'm editing the first edition of a textbook at the moment. And when I was reviewing the literature and looking for some newer content, I found some really good papers and I thought, that's really amazing. I found a paper from somebody that I know and I didn't even know she'd written that paper. So I then um, retweeted it online. I just found a paper by and shared that. And she also shared that and uh, that went quite um, to quite a few people as well. But it's having a purpose for what that is. I will use it because I'm in marketing for customer service issues, but I'll always do that in a polite way. I won't share what I'm eating for breakfast, lunch or dinner because it's just not relevant to, to my Twitter. So what should you do? So just to, to conclude on this, and then I'll look at other questions you've got and invite you to ask any other questions before we step into our break shortly. You need to think about a purpose and objectives. And I think somebody may have asked about how much time do you need to spend on this? Not that much. It, well, it depends how many papers you're getting published. If you're getting a paper published every month, then I would say you'd be going to that uh, every month. But typically, many people will get a paper published. Um, you know, you may have one every six months, every 12, every 18 months, depending on what else you're doing. So I would say engage with LinkedIn about a specific paper, um, maybe um, once a year or whenever it's relevant to you. I look at my LinkedIn probably once, um, once a month, just to see what's been happening in my network. So I think about going to LinkedIn as going to a meeting. So I would have a look, get a coffee and have a look at all these things um, and just do that over a 15 minute coffee break. And then I would probably add a post on there, not that often. I probably add um, a big post, a piece of content from me, maybe once every four, six, eight months, not so often. Twitter I use more often because it's my go-to place for news and for um, latest um, research that I might be following, areas, those sort of things. So um, it depends on what your purpose is. When you've got your Twitter name and your LinkedIn name, make sure you actually add that to your email signature, make sure it's on your presentations and make sure your biography is quite strong and it's got um, relevance to what you're doing. Use the one profile photo. I always say, 
somebody said, well, what are the rules on photos? I, I've got a photo that's a bit older, but it's a good photo and it's, it's recent or decent. And I think a, a good photo that's maybe a little bit older is better than a recent one. I'm not a photographer, so I'm not going to try and take a photo of myself in lockdown. I'll wait till I get out of lockdown and I can do that. And then look at the website where you're sending people to and send them to that specific website, whether that's your ORCID, whether that's your, um, for example, your um, university homepage, whether it's your project homepage, or whether it's to um, the DOI link of a recent paper that you've published. Make sure it's relevant for you. Yeah, so I work in the UCL media relations team. Um, we're based centrally in communications and marketing. Um, so covering all of UCL together. Um, that's the team I put up on the screen there. There are about um, nine or 10 of us normally. And we're a mixture of um, our backgrounds vary from sort of journalism or communications and PR backgrounds um, with, very, with various expertises. We each have different subjects, um, sorry, faculty responsibilities. So as Audrey said, I lead on the faculties of brain sciences and life sciences, but we do work quite closely together. Um, so um, to a certain extent, you can sort of contact anyone in the team um, if you want help with promoting something to the media. And we also work quite closely with other communications people across UCL. Um, so there are a couple of people who are helping us sort of part-time right now from Global Engagement Office and uh, OVPR, but then we also have really good relationships with sort of faculty comms people. So we'll share stories in terms of um, to figure out what's the, the best place for something, whether it's something that's for UCL internal channels or the media um, and how to sort of um, join forces to help promote things. Um, so essentially my team is tasked with um, getting positive media coverage of UCL. Um, what the way that we do that, um, we're really regularly responding to queries and requests from journalists. Um, they're calling us really frequently, sort of every, every day we'll be getting calls from journalists. Uh, most frequently that would be uh, expert comment. Um, so a journalist is looking for an expert in such and such to comment on a story that's in the news. Obviously that's loads of COVID related things this year, um, but it can be all kinds of things. Sometimes that's relating to something that we've promoted. Um, sometimes it's something that's sort of brand new to us, um, but, that, but we might have someone who can comment on this sort of external news story. Um, we also um, do a lot of press releases, for, prepare a lot of press releases of distribution. Mostly that's based on new research. Um, they're essentially what we'll choose to promote is based on what we think is most likely to get mainstream media coverage. So which will have the most impact in the external news media environment. Um, if something is more for, uh, if something isn't really for sort of mainstream news audiences, uh, if it's more for sort of internal audiences or um, maybe policymakers, um, rather than general public, then there are different teams that will that will work on that. Um, yeah, it's most often new studies that we're promoting because um, there's so much interesting research going on at UCL all the time um, that we get a lot of news, a lot of media coverage based on that. But there, there are a lot of different stories that we're happy to promote. Um, and so we're always sort of considering, depending on what is um, has the potential to make it into the media. Um, Sometimes we'll send press releases to our sort of full list of contacts. Sometimes we'll pitch stories in on a targeted basis. Maybe if it's um, uh, something that um, might benefit from just a one-on-one -on -one interview more, or if it's a bit more specialized, we might target a specific uh, niche publication maybe, um, rather than sending it to everyone all at once. And we also pitch in comment pieces. So op-eds, um, comment analysis, opinion pieces. Um, and so often we will we'll help academics pitch in their own stories um, or else we can do that for them and sort of craft a compelling pitch if, if an academic wants to write their own, um, their own article about something. Um, we also manage a lot of reactive media issues. So as I said, our job is sort of promoting positive media coverage of UCL, um, but part of that job also involves ensuring that there isn't negative coverage of UCL. Um, 
So if there's something that's happened that could be sort of reputationally damaging to UCL, uh, my team will um, initially will sort of just try to get the facts, figure out what what actually happened, what's UCL's side of the story. Um, sometimes it might be a bit of a misunderstanding, and then we'll issue issue a statement um, about what um, you know sort of what happened, what we're going to do about it, um, and and so on to sort of show UCL's side of things, but. Mostly, but that's essentially that sort of minority of the job that we do. Um, as mostly, it's um, what's going on at UCL is pretty positive, so we're mostly promoting the good stories. And yeah, we all, we also uh, monitor media coverage, and so we collate and promote it across UCL channels, um, social media, newsletters, and so on, and share with communications colleagues across the university um, to share that out. Um, but even if we haven't actively promoted a story, if we haven't um, uh, haven't led on something, my team is, al is also ready to offer support and advice to people who are dealing with the media. Um, so any, any academic, any, any staff member who might be, um, who might have been contacted by the media, um, as well as senior leadership teams will advise them on um, with messaging and strategy for anything that's relating to media outreach. Um, so certainly we, um, UCL gets pretty um, wide spread of coverage all the time. Um, so over the last year, uh, we sent out something like um, 500 press releases, pitches, UCL news stories, um, which are mainly, um, it's mainly, as I said, that's mainly research outputs. Um, and that's resulted in over something like over 2,000 different um, different pieces of what we'd consider to be top tier news coverage. So that's um, coverage that's in maybe the BBC or in um, you know ITV or so on, whether it's broadcast or radio or internationally or in a newspaper. Um, and then, of course, there's even more coverage that um, that would be in more specialized publications, which we often will still work with, but uh, it's not as much something we can prioritize necessarily. And yeah, over 500 calls from journalists um, for comment, asking for experts to comment on things, whether that's relating to um, expert, experts that we've proactively promoted, or if it's reactive, there they've just called us about it. And then, yeah, plus the invisible stories that may, that you may not have seen that we've just managed sort of um, explaining the UCL side of things um, to avoid negative media coverage. Uh, it's difficult, of course, to get published in outlets like The Times or you know The Guardian, things like that. Um, what we an outlet we do often work with um, and they are often a bit more willing um, to take things from early career researchers. Um, it's called The Conversation. They exclusively publish articles by, um, by academics. Um, so I think you need to have a university affiliation to publish with them. And so, so it's not journalists that write their articles, it's just the academics. Um, academics can pitch their own articles to The Conversation, but also my team um, can do the pitching for you, can help you craft a really compelling pitch that would appeal to their editors. And then those editors will help the, um, the researcher to, um, to write something that really appeals to a general audience, um, reach potentially a pretty broad audience because that, um, their articles do get published in pretty mainstream publications. Um, so I wanna talk about some of the benefits of doing media. Um, so of course, it's really valuable to raise UCL's profile. Um, of course, it's important to showcase, uh, to improve our reputation, as well as um, the reputation of your department and faculty. It's um, good to showcase, you know, what UCL is particularly good at. Um, but it also can be really valuable in raising your own personal profile, um, particularly for people who are a bit earlier in their careers. Um, sometimes this can help in attracting um, funding or even study participants. Um, so. There's an example I put up in there. Again, it's a bit of an extreme example, but there was a story last year about um, a woman who doesn't feel any pain due to a rare genetic mutation. When we promoted that, it was a study about the genetic mutation, um, but, but it got a lot of coverage, particularly because this woman was, was happy to share her story. Um, and because it got so much coverage internationally um, about a very rare condition, 
the researchers were contacted by something like 80 or 90 different people who also have some sort of pain and sensitivity um, who were offering to take part in studies. Um, that's the extreme example, um, and it was potentially hugely helpful to the researchers in, in building new studies about um, um, pain and sensitivity, but there are a lot of other examples that we've had of um, by engaging with the media, um, it can help attract more study participants. Um, and generally, um, it's also really good for relationships with funders and partners if we're promoting your work, not just sort of into a scientific journal, but more broadly, um, particularly as, um, especially if it's related to public policy, of course, but even otherwise just um, people want to see that you're making an impact, not just um, within the research community, but more broadly. Um, and yeah, I think I'm probably preaching the converted here just to say that I think it's really important that sort of publicly funded research going on at, place, at places like UCL um, should be communicated to the public um, and public has sort of a right to know about that, uh, um, the research going on here. And, and just a few comments on, so a lot of academics I know are, are concerned about engaging the media in terms of worrying um, that their research might be sort of misconstrued. Maybe you've seen um, misleading headlines in the media that relate to your field um, and you don't want to sort of feed into that. Um, what I would say to that is that um, that's only going to happen more if academics don't engage with the media. Um, so by speaking to journalists, um, it can be really helpful in sort of, um, sort of debunking myths that might already be out there. Um, so especially lately in terms of things relating to COVID-19, um, often by getting experts to sort of go on the news and, and explain, um, um, explain the science, of, uh, um, it, it can help to sort of um, yeah, debunk a lot of prevalent myths. Um, and I think it can also just be seen as sort of an extension of your role as educators, um, just the value of you're not just educating fellow scientists or, you know, partners you're actively working with, but you can also be educating the general public by engaging with the news media. Um, so I want to talk a bit about what kind of stories make the news, so which ones are more likely to um, be relevant to a really broad audience. Um, a big part is, you know, will the findings affect people's lives and behaviors? So this especially relates to health stories, but also could just be that things help to explain things that everyone is sort of familiar with. Um, or of course, if it you know, relates to public policy that is relevant to a really wide group of people, if it um, in the sense that something that everyone would you know, be familiar with and be interested in hearing about you know, the impacts of that policy, perhaps. Um, in terms, um, certainly timing is really important. We always like to have a news hook to something. Um, so often that would be the publication of a new report, a new academic paper. Um, sometimes if there isn't a particular um, sort of clear news hook like that, um, we might be able to sort of latch on to something else that's going on, um, something else in the news, or just, you know, we always need to find some reason why we're talking about this now, why today. Um, another point is uh, um, anything that's sort of surprising or a bit quirky can get into the news a bit more. So things like that, that earwax sampling study, um, something a bit unexpected, um, or maybe if it's, you know, about sort of a, um, a policy proposal that is, you know, might maybe has never been done before that would surprise people that it might actually, you know, be potentially effective. Um, sometimes that could be more likely to make the news than something that's just a, um, you know, a sort of a bit different from how things, from what you might expect. And yes, yeah, certainly if anything's controversial or really high profile, that can help if it can sort of settle a longstanding debate. Um, if it's, you know, if it's something that's been in the news a lot before, then you know, that would increase the chance that maybe, you know, a new angle to the story might be worth, might be something we could promote and get some news coverage of. Um, I put up major scientific discovery there, um, but that's with a big, ca big caveat in that it's massive scientific breakthroughs don't necessarily get media coverage. It's not always, doesn't always correlate that perfectly. Um, sometimes um, something is unusual, can get a lot of coverage and sometimes a huge breakthrough won't get much coverage because it's difficult to explain uh, to make it relevant to the general public. Maybe it's best really for a, a you know um, an audience within that field. 
some of the things that my team doesn't really promote that we, but the other people at UCL will promote, um, things like new studies or grants for new studies. Um, we'll often put up a story on the website for that, but um, usually people in the general public are more interested in hearing the results of studies. So um, often, um, you know, it's better to approach us sort of, you know, a little bit later down the line once you have some results to report. Um, but sometimes if it's just a really unusual study, that could be um, something to promote or particularly massive study, of course. Um, and yeah, generally for the awards, appointments, events, conferences, vi conferences, visits, they're often best for sort of the faculty comms team or the VP offices might lead on that. Um, generally speaking, here's sort of the, the process we mostly work with, with, but we can be quite flexible for different types of stories. Um, big tip is just please get in touch with us well in advance um, so that we can be ready to promote the news when it's new. So if it's a new research paper, if you let us know um, when it's accepted into a journal, that's often a good rule of thumb because hopefully that'll give us at least a week or two, maybe longer than that, before the study is actually published online so that we can prepare for it. So if an academic sends me a paper or a new report, then I'll review it and assess the assess it the, the media potential and strategy, potential strategy. Um, I'll always speak with the researcher directly before I start drafting anything, because I really want to hear from, um, you know, to answer some questions, but just to hear in their own words, um, you know, what's most important about this, you know, what they think the implications might be. Um, and then I always will uh, um, send, my, send my draft to the researchers to make sure that they're happy with it. Um, uh, so that I don't send anything out, you know, without the approval of the academics. And we'll also share it with collaborators, funding bodies to make sure so that everyone can sort of promote it in their own channels and that everyone's happy um, with how they've been represented in what we're sending out. Um, we're generally not really trying to compete too much with, you know, with other institutions. We'd rather be collaborative. Um, you know, if we help them, they can help us later on as well. Um, and then typically, if it's going to be a press release, we'll, we like to send, send out the press release a couple days before it actually gets published online. Um, so we use an embargo system, which means that um, if I send the press release to journalists on a Monday, then um, say if it's coming out on a Wednesday, journalists aren't allowed to publish anything publicly um, you know, in, until the embargo lifts on Wednesday. This helps for quality control. It means that the journalists have the time to really properly review the paper, speak to the academics potentially before they publish something, rather than just racing to publish something before you know the other newspaper gets it, um, which can lead to more um, you know, lower quality um, coverage and you know less responsible coverage potentially. Um, so a few tips about so this is sort of um, how we tips to how we would approach journalists, but also it can help in terms of how you might want to approach us. Um, just tips sort of how to pitch your work. Um, big thing to remember is just know your audience, who are you speaking to, um, whether that's, um, so try to explain things in a way that would, um, that you know, whoever you're speaking to can understand. And if you're speaking to the media, say if you're doing a radio interview, that's not just, you know, your audience isn't just the person interviewing you, but also the general public. So just consider what, what they would be able to relate to. Um, we always need to consider sort of what our news hook is. Um, we like to be able to have just sort of one sentence of, you know, what's the main story, um, which isn't necessarily what you might think of as the main finding of your study. It might be more of a secondary finding, a secondary outcome um, might be more interesting to the general public, might be easier for people to connect to, um, even if it's not you know, the main thing you're looking into. Um, and yeah, it's really helpful before you start engaging with the media just to consider what would be your most newsworthy finding just in one sentence. How would you really um, pare it down to one sentence? And then some other things that we always try to, um, to bring together that would really help a story be of interest to the general public, to the media, um, or additional materials like images and video, um, that can often make the difference between something getting picked up or not. Um, um, basically, all kinds of journalists, um, whether it's TV or, well, not radio, I guess, but whether it's TV or online or newspapers, 
they're always looking for images um, to fill to fill the pages, fill the website um, or videos. Um, so that's something to keep in mind potentially as you're doing your work. Um, that if you might um, you know, consider the fact you might want to communicate it later on as you're actually doing the project. So maybe take pictures if there's something that might not be you might not need the image for your research paper, but it might be helpful to communicate it to the public later on. It's also really valuable to have a case study. Um, so like that woman who doesn't feel any pain, um, but it doesn't need to be someone that was necessarily a part of the study. It could just be someone that um, sort of puts a face to the story that we're telling. Um, so sometimes we'll include quotes from, say if it's a health story about um, you know, a new, uh, say a new treatment, we might include a quote from someone who has that particular condition that could be treated even if they weren't part of the study, but they can help explain why this is so exciting and valuable, you know, what it means to them. Um, and also, yeah, any sort of graphs or sort of easy to understand stats um, can also be really helpful as well. Um, and, okay. Um, so I'm gonna go through, um, just before I finish off, I'll go through a couple of examples in a bit more depth. Um, so here is a paper that I promoted last year. Um, it was about a new study that was being published in, I think it was Lancet Psychiatry. Um, helpfully, the academics contacted me about two or three weeks in advance, so we were able to um, get everything ready in time. It was a clinical trial that was um, investigating um, um, an antidepressant, and it was the primary outcome was whether it helped depressive symptoms within six weeks. Unfortunately, it didn't actually have a significant impact on depressive symptoms within six weeks. Um, so it could be interpreted as it didn't work um, in the sense that it didn't succeed for that primary outcome, but it that wasn't, there was a lot more to the story than that. And it did help with anxiety symptoms. It did help with um, subjective quality of life. And it helped a bit after 12 weeks as well for depressive symptoms. So the researchers, were a bit concerned about it being misinterpreted. They didn't want to have headlines saying antidepressants don't work. So we handled things really carefully. Um, we held a press briefing in conjunction with the Science Media Center. They're an independent press office that, that, um, that works with journalists and academics to ensure that um, science, health, environment reporting is really evidence-based and sort of informed by experts. So we held a press briefing. And I also sent out this press release um, that was really careful to sort of include all the different caveats to the, to the study, um, you know, not just what it found, but also what it didn't find. Um, so we included a concise headline there, um, antidepressants may reduce anxiety more than depressive symptoms rather than just focusing on the sort of the not so positive outcome. Um, and then we sort of explained that just a little bit more in our, first sentence of our press release. Um, so we always have to, in our press releases, we always have to focus on what's most interesting to everyone right off the bat. Um, so we always have to have a really clear, compelling first sentence, which is very different to um, a lot of academic writing where you might, um, you know, you'll start with your introduction and you know, your literature review and the context and everything, you might not get to the key finding until a bit later on. We need to get to it right off the bat, particularly when we're reaching out to journalists as they'll get a press release in their inbox and then they'll just look at the headline. And if they're not interested by the headline, then they won't click it, they won't, so they won't see what the press release was. We also need to have really short, succinct headlines, again, because if it's 20 words, our headline, they might only see the first six words in their in their inbox. Um, so, that, so we have to have a really succinct headline, slightly longer first sentence, and then continue with the most, what's most compelling to keep people interested. Otherwise, this also goes for just writing for online, um, um, online outlets generally. People will click away if they get bored after a few sentences. Um, so here we clarified at the first line that it did lead to a reduction in anxiety symptoms, which are found in depression, which a lot of people wouldn't know. Um, and then we went into the main, um, and then this is only half the press release. It was a lot longer than that to explain all the key, uh, all the key findings, but we did um, what's on the screen there. The researchers say their findings support the continued prescription of antidepressants. 
because um, we really want to get that message across um, to avoid um, you know, a health scare. Um, and overall, um, the results were pretty good. Um, so you see there's a BBC article there, which actually went with a headline quite similar to what, what ours was. It, Antidepressant works um, in quotes by reducing anxiety symptoms first. So if we provide the media with really compelling, um, if, if we write things in a really compelling way, um, we can provide them with compelling quotes, um, then we can help control how they're going to write things. Um, if we write something that's really, you know, it's really in really technical language, um, you know, maybe it's really precise and exactly how it you know, ideally should be reported potentially, um, but it's not, you know, it's just not the kind of language you'd expect you'd ever see in a, in a news story, um, you know, on the BBC or something, then the journalists are going to find their own way to write about it. But if we give them a really compelling, um, some really compelling um, quotes and sort of, you know, explaining things with metaphors maybe, um, then they'll use that and, you know, use the exact quotes and, and so we can sort of control the messaging a bit more. Um, and then, yeah, I also worked with the, um, the academics also wrote a conversation article, really helped them get the story out there in their own words. Um, there were some headlines that weren't quite as good. So that Telegraph it was actually on the front page of the Telegraph. Um, what it said most common antidepressant barely relieved symptoms. However, the article itself was actually quite good. Um, sometimes that's what happens. The headline will be written by an editor rather than the journalist that wrote the story. Um, and so the headline might sensationalize it a little bit more than the story itself, but it's not necessarily that damaging because it gets people reading the article and then they read all the important things that are in there. And that was actually quite a good article. Um, I was checking the time. I think I can just quickly go through it then. Just to finish off, I um, just want to go through a few tips about storytelling that I think are quite helpful for um, telling stories for a lot of different audiences, whether this is, um, you know, if you're trying to sell your story to me, um, to other comms people, or you're writing a blog, or when I'm writing a press release or whatever it is, big tip is just that no one will ever complain because something is too easy to understand. Um, so assume the reader knows nothing, but it doesn't mean that we assume the reader is stupid. Um, so we're always sort of trying to um, write in a way that uh, appeals to people who have just different expertise that don't know, necessarily know anything about the particular subject at hand um, as we'd like it to reach a wide audience, of course. Big point is that no one actually has to read what we write. Um, you know, no one has to read you know, my press releases or your blog or a news article. So make every line count so that people don't um, get a bit bored if you're getting really bogged down in the details early on. Um, you need to keep people's attention as you're going through the piece. Um, and yeah, story will only ever really say one big thing. Often this will be the first sentence. Um, so you need to be able to um, sort of pare it down into just one sentence and beware of jargon, academic or technical language. Um, sometimes you need to say something with um, in really precise language, but we would avoid that early on in a press release and maybe just get to that later on where we have, where we can just explain it sort of lower down in an article. And then if you are contacted by a journalist, um, here are a few tips for um, doing well in an interview. Um, one big tip is just, um, I think, just keep in mind that journalists aren't normally out to get you. It's not like when they're interviewing um, a politician where they're trying to sort of catch you out. Generally, when they're speaking to um, academics, they're just trying to understand things better um, and trying to get a compelling story that they can, they can write. Um, so that, um, that so don't be afraid to sort of say that you don't know the answer to something or you know ask if you can maybe sort of repeat yourself if it's not a live interview um, to explain things a bit better. Um, but before the interview, it's really good to consider, you know, if you have a particular agenda, um, you know, what's your story that you're trying to get across? It can be helpful to sort of pare it down into sort of three key messages, keep that top of mind um, so that even if you don't know what questions you'll be asked, if you consider those three, if you keep those three key messages, top of mind, then you sort of have those at the ready um, uh, to sort of fit into your answers and prepare sort of a one sentence summary um, for each one, ideally. Um, 
so that you know how you'd say it in just one sentence because otherwise if yeah if you go on for you know loads of sentences to explain something ultimately the journalist will find a different way to explain it more succinctly um, whereas you want to be a bit more control of what what messaging is going out there consider what examples you have that can really build your story that sort of bring your story to life um, so sometimes it can be helpful just to you know if some people might have interesting stories about why, you know, why they're so passionate about this subject. It might not be about what, you know, what this they found in this research or, you know, what they've written in this briefing. Um, there might be just an interesting story behind the story to tell. So consider, um, you know, what else you have. Memorable facts, observations, anecdotes um, that might be worth telling. Again, remember your audience, consider, consider who you're ultimately trying to connect with. Um, so what messages you want to get in for um, people that might be li listening to this, reading to this. And then also consider what are the likely or possible negatives that might come up? Is there a sort of worst case scenario headline that you want to avoid? Um, and if you consider that in advance, then you're more able to sort of think about, okay, how do I avoid that? You know, is it by, and potentially that's by making sure that you say in the interview, you know, what we didn't find is this you know, this does not mean this. Um, like for the antidepressants study, you know, this does not mean that people should stop taking their antidepressants. Um, so the more prepared you are for that, the more we can avoid that. Um, and then, yeah, that's about it for me. Just to finish off a, um, a few tips um, before you might start, before you start engaging with the media, look out for stories related to your field in the media to see how they're covered, what stories are getting picked up, is there something missing that you think you could you could really add? Um, explore other resources and awards for training. Um, my team does a lot of presentations like this to different audiences across UCL, but also um, there are sort of media fellowships that um, which can be offered, especially by your your funder your funding body might might have some other offerings that might help you out there. Um, and just get in touch to find out um, how else we can help you. Um, as Audrey said, uh, my name is Catherine Welsh. I work with Audrey in UCL Public Policy. I'm Head of External Engagements and Partnerships there, um, supporting not just public policy, but the Grand Challenges and other OBBR, BPR programmes in building their external relationships. Um, but I have, I would say, 15 years or so uh, experience working in um, knowledge brokerage and knowledge mobilisation. Uh, one of the ways of doing that is through uh, writing blogs. Um, I'm not going to take up too much time today. I think a lot of what I'm about to say uh, echoes what you've just heard from Chris. There's a, a lot of synergy between uh, blog writing and, and media writing. So um, I probably whiz through because uh, I think you've probably heard um, a lot of it already. But I just want to share with you what I think um, are some of the, the top five tips um, for writing blogs, the top five take home messages to keep in your mind um, when you sit down at your laptop or with a pen and paper if you're old school um, to, to, to write out a blog. Uh, so number one, and I think as Chris has sort of mentioned, a killer opening is critical. If you want people to read your blog, um, you really need to catch them uh, at the start by having a really great opening line, a really great uh, title that's concise, that indicates what your blog is about, that's going to speak to your reader and um, tell them, uh, you know, what the following post is, they're going to be reading. Um, so I think thinking long and hard about your title is really important. Uh, I would also suggest that you leave the title to last write your piece first and then come back and think about how you're going to sort of summarize that in, in, your, in your opening title. Uh, so that's tip number one. Number two, building your story. And, and again, this, this links to what uh, we've just had Chris talking about when we're talking about um, media stories. When you're writing for a general purpose audience, even a, a knowledgeable or sort of uh, informed one, um, you need to build out your story as if you were building a pyramid. So you start um, with your, your first opening paragraph should really contain all of the information that your reader is going to want to know. This is often, as Chris said, a, a single sentence, um, but it should have that who, what, when, why, where, and how, uh, and the, your reader should be able to get the full gist of what your story is going to be out about from that initial paragraph. From there, you will start to build in the detail of the content, you'll start to round out the information, um, you'll start to build out your different um, storylines, 
uh, and your, your piece will take shape from there. So think about when you're constructing a blog, like any other um, storytelling or media story, think about that pyramid type shape and, and building the detail as you move down through the piece. Know your audience. Another critical thing about blog writing or general media writing is to think about who you're writing for. Avoid jargon, avoid uh, acronyms, Think about the, the fact that your audience might not necessarily know the full detail of what you're um, talking about, the full detail of your research, or be very knowledgeable to a great depth in your field. Um, so think about uh, how you're going to make sure that they can understand and, and take in everything that you're writing. So keeping the audience in your mind as you're going through your drafting is also um, really important. Number five, uh, number four, sorry, images. Um, a picture often can paint a thousand words, but think about how you're going to use images and use them wisely. Um, your image use should uh, complement and supplement what you're writing and not detract from it. Um, it should be uh, useful to your reader to help inform them about your, your, your writing, uh, not, not to, to add complication or, or make it more difficult for them to understand what you're writing about. Um, other things to bear in mind, uh, consider copyright if the images are not your own. Um, you can always get this double checked with sort of media specialists or the media team, um, but be aware that, that you know, of, of extra um, considerations around use of images. Um, make sure that you, where possible, can always caption your image um, so that we've got uh, full uh, accessibility for uh, various types of readers or people engaging with your blog. Not everybody can always access the image, so uh, 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 an alternative caption is always a useful idea as well. Uh, number five, be professional. Um, the, the final thing I think is, is really thinking about being professional with your work. Check, check and check again. Check your spelling, check your senses. Um, make sure that you've uh, attributed and uh, acknowledged sources of material, um, get somebody else, a second person, or maybe even a third to proofread your work. Um, you, you cannot be thorough enough when you're writing a, a, a general purpose piece, but from a professional perspective to make sure that the information there is correct. Um, it all makes sense. Uh, and you, you know, it's all, it's all done correctly and professionally. Um, so, you know, be professional, I think, is the is the final um, tip there. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I really don't count myself at all as an expert on social media, but um, having come back to UCL after quite a long time working in policy and policy research, I was lucky enough to be on a master's course with a lecturer who taught us all how to do blogs, and I found it extremely useful ever since particularly in trying to make academic research much more digestible for policymakers. Um, and also, I suppose, just promoting the research that I'm doing. Uh, I think blogs are very good at encouraging you to talk in a more conversational style about your research, really get your um, findings to a bigger audience. But also, I think it's great for policymakers to see who's doing what, to think about possible um, academics they could collaborate with in the future. Um, and also that then perhaps you can encourage people to, to read longer academic pieces of work when they have the time. Um, so Audrey mentioned that I did a couple of blogs for the conversation. I've also set up a blog with WordPress and contributed to a Medium blog. So I'll just very briefly um, mention those two. Um, so WordPress, um, you may very well already be using this, but I find it a very easy interface to work with. So you can set up your own personal blog site, you know, on your interests. Um, and there's a kind of a backstage area to WordPress where, called a dashboard where you can write draft blogs, you can upload all sorts of media, video media, photographs that you're going to actually put into future blogs. It's a really nice um, tool to, to use. Um, and so this is a, a picture of my uh, blog on uh, WordPress. Um, so what you can do is actually encourage people to, to sign up to receive your, your blogs by email. Um, I found it was very important to think about these categories on the left hand side to get these keywords um, working. So, for example, my blog was all about how the built environment is, is used by people in cities. Um, and I have a kind of special interest in railway arches. 
Uh, so I wrote a, a blog about this and then featured that as a keyword. And in the end, actually, the BBC London got in touch with me and interviewed me about railway arches. So it goes to show that even a personal blog that you think won't be that accessible can actually be picked up by broader Google searches. Um, but as Audrey mentioned, the conversation um, has been a, a real eye opener for me. So um, I think the conversation was set up um, in 2011 by an Australian academic who wanted universities to be kind of vast newsrooms, uh, much better at communicating what they were doing. Uh, and the blogs, so again, I wrote a blog for the conversation about railway arches, which at the time was very topical because it was just when Network Rail were about to sell off a whole series of railway arches and therefore putting the livelihoods of the businesses that were operating underneath the arches into question. Um, I was very pleased because it got 12,000 reads, but I actually realised that, in fact, UCL bloggers on the conversation get hundreds of thousands of reads, I think, I think perhaps even a million reads, so this was nothing, but for me it was a big impact. Um, and what's interesting is that the conversation publishes the blog, obviously, on their own website, but then it can be picked up by global media. And I know Chris Lane has already talked about this. Um, it comes with advantages and disadvantages because your article could be published by a, a journal or a newspaper with, that you don't really like the editorial stance of, and they can put a new headline on it. You, you do have to be aware that your text will be used in different ways. You lose a certain degree of control. Uh, so I wrote another blog for them looking at the kind of decline of the manufacturing industry in the UK um, and this time I kind of framed it around three important lessons uh, for the future because I think the conversation are very keen on you um, kind of uh, framing things in, in a kind of succinct but well-structured way. Um, and actually, Audrey organised a very interesting uh, training session with the conversation earlier this year, where they gave some tips for topics for blogs, which I thought you, you might be interested in. Um, so first of all, they were saying that, you know, when you're writing a blog, you should perhaps think about finding something in the news and then adding value to it. Uh, often, if you express some kind of contrary or countervailing um, way of thinking about something that's popular, uh, it's great for academics to be explainers. Don't be afraid just to pick a topic which seems quite complex and to kind of explain it in a simple way. Um, people like lists. Um, they also recommended avoiding questions as headlines, which I thought was quite interesting because uh, you, you're trying to show you have an answer and not a question. Uh, and as Chris mentioned earlier, thinking about hooks on which you can hang a bigger picture. Um, and they also have this kind of pitching page. So if you wanted to pitch a blog, you could you can do that. I know Chris has already mentioned it, but you can also work with specific editors. And I really like that side of the conversation. So there were two editors that worked with me um, on blogs. Um, and what they did was they helped me to kind of organize the text, but they also provided images. They helped me with headlines. So you really felt that you were in a sort of editorial process with them. They put a lot of effort in, which I much appreciated. Uh, and to conclude, the other thing I've been doing is kind of publishing um, on Medium, and this is actually with a UCL uh, site. So it's interesting, Audrey, to see that you mentioned this UCL blog, Public Postings. Um, so the, the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose has their own blog. Um, and so recently, I'd actually just co-edited an a, a edition of the Local Economy Journal, which I wanted to promote. So I did a blog uh, on this IIPP website with somebody else. And it was just good really in, in kind of summarizing the key findings of that special edition of the journal and getting it out to a much broader set of policymakers than would necessarily have been reading the kind of longer academic text. Um, so yeah, there are lots of different ways that you can do blogs, but so far for me, it's been a really positive experience. There's one question that says, um, at what point in one's PhD should you be putting out blogs? Um, should, and do you risk losing originality credit if you do it too early? Um, so I don't know if Catherine or Francesca or anyone on the call wants to, to speak to that. I'm, I'm happy to. I was just trying to type an answer, but, but not speedily enough. Um, I think um, it's not necessarily a question about what point in your studies should you be thinking about blog writing, but thinking about the reason for doing so. I think as with any other sort of media or general type writing, you only really want to be writing blogs when they've got a purpose. 
um, I think if you're writing just for the sake of doing so, that's when you, and you're trying to push out a high volume of, of writing, that's when you risk losing your originality and losing the focus of, of what you're trying to write about. So I think um, blogs, other media writing can be done at any point in your studies, as long as you think that you've got something interesting to say. Um, and you know, you can always get that sense checked with colleagues, um, with the UCL media team, um, with with your you know your fellow students and with your supervisors, etc. Before you embark on actually writing anything, um, I think that's probably the take home message that I, I would recommend. Um, and Evie also just mentioned that there are sites where you can get royalty free images, um, Pixabay, Pexels, and Unsplash. So if if you don't have if you have a shoddy camera on your phone like I do and you don't want to take your own then there are some sites where you can get your own royalty free um, pictures. Audrey if I could just add a point yeah. um interestingly there's research that goes back to 1993 that talks about uh, content with imagery or with something moving gets more retweets likes and everything else so the use of images is a good call and I think it was Chris who was saying, why not take images during your process? And I thought that's a brilliant idea. We, we don't think often when you're in the process of doing the research, you don't think about that end point because you're in it. So there's a good argument there to think about that end point and what that looks like and where that could be used and potentially taking images from different angles, whatever that is, because then it could be used in different places too. Yeah. And definitely, I'm, I've heard that on Twitter that um, tweets with pictures are far more likely to get retweeted um, and to get attention than just some text. 